Okay, so thanks for all the survivors that are here today. So it's the last talk. And I would like to talk a little bit about uh, the flow case, the flow case from the theorem that we discussed yesterday. So remember that yesterday we considered a two-dimensional, a surface diffeomorphism that had, uh, well, in general you assume it has positive topological entropy so that you can have measures that are hyperbolic. And, well, we were able to code simultaneously all hyperbolic measures, right? By what? By a topological Markov shift. Given an oriented graph, we will consider the space of z index paths on this graph with the dynamics of the left shift. And that's exactly the structure that we were able to construct as an extension of our diffeomorphism. So today I would like to consider a three-dimensional flow. It's natural when you have a result in two dimensions for diffeomorphisms and you want to get four flows. So first consider three dimensions. And that's what we are going to consider. And we are going to assume further that the flow has positive speed. That means that it has no fixed points. So in other words, the vector field that is generated by the flow is non-zero everywhere, okay? And our goal, there is a small reverberation here. What? Ah, okay. And our goal is to try to code, to get a similar coding for uh, he hyperbolic measures. So what is the model that we are trying to construct? If you remember in the first lecture, I defined what is known as a topological Markov flow. So what is a topological Markov flow? It is the flow version of the topological Markov shift. So it is a suspension, suspension flow in a suspension space where the basis dynamics is the dynamics of a shift and you have a positive roof function that tells you the time it takes for you to uh, start in the section in the base and come back to the base, okay? So that is exactly what we aim to construct today. There will be a big difference from the, the result of Sarig is that we are only able so far to code one measure at a time. So let me say what the setting is. So let M3 be a smooth, smooth, closed, compact without boundary, uh, Riemannian manifold. Let x be a C1 plus beta vector field on M. With positive speed, so I assume that x of p is different from zero everywhere. Uh, let phi be the flow generated by x. And given a positive he, let mu be a he hyperbolic probability measure. So remember that we are in three dimensions and we always have a Lyapunov exponent which is equal to zero. It is in the flow direction. So we have two other Lyapunov exponents and saying that this measure is he hyperbolic is saying that almost everywhere one of these two other Lyapunov exponents is bigger than he and the other is smaller than minus he. Okay? And the theorem that we want to sketch the proof is that under those conditions, there exists a topological Markov flow. <coughs> sigma r, this is the suspension space, and small sigma r is the suspension flow, and a holder continuous map pi sub r, that comes from sigma r to m, such that it satisfies the same three properties that we got for diffeomorphism, so the first one is that, I'm always confused about that, pi r composed with sigma r t, the time t of the suspension flow is conjugated by the time t of the flow phi t, 
by pi r. So this happens for all real t's. Also, this coding is relevant for the mu, for the measure mu. So this guy has full mu measure. And finally, we have finiteness to one. So for every x, or I'm just going to write finiteness to one. The precise statement is to get a point that in spi is in pi r of sigma r sharp and saying that the number of pre-images of this point in sigma r sharp is finite, okay? But let us forget about that, okay? So note again that I have to fix my measure mu a priori. Given my measure mu, I get a topological Markov flow. If I change my measure mu, possibly I would get another topological Markov flow, okay? So for each measure, you have a coding. Okay, so uh, what is the idea to, 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 to prove this theorem? Someone has a suggestion? What do we do when we have flows? Usually we don't like to work with flows, right? We like to work with diffeomorphisms. Exactly. So what I want to do is that I want to mod out the flow direction and try to analyze what happens in the transverse direction. And analyzing what happens in the transverse direction, what does that mean? It means that I will fix a section of my flow, and instead of analyzing the flow, I will an analyze the first return map of a point of the section to the section, okay? So the idea is to mod out the flow direction, and analyze the hyperbolicity in the transverse direction. Okay, how? We are going to use Poincaré sections and point array return maps. Okay? So how do I construct a point array section? So let us say that we have a disk, two-dimensional disk, that is transverse to X. So I have a small piece of a surface here that I know that in every point, the tangent space of the surface does not contain the vector field X, okay? And I'm just going to introduce a notation now. So given an interval from R, you let phi I of D to be the following, you get D and you flow D with the real times that belong to this interval I. So this is just the union of phi T of D as T belongs to I, okay? So if this I is non-empty, I'm pretty sure that this set here has non-empty interior. Why? Because my vector field is, not, is different from zero everywhere. So what is the, the picture of this phi i of d? So if I have d like that, I just flow. Let us say that i contains the time zero. So I just flow d a little bit above and possibly a little bit below. And what I get is known as a flow box. Okay? So this is phi i of d. And how do I get how do I construct a Poincaré section? How do I construct a section, so it's a two-dimensional object, that sees all the points of my flow? And what do I mean by seeing all the points of my flow? I mean that whenever I get a point of the manifold M, after some finite time, I can flow this point and hit the section. Well, since these guys have non-empty non -empty interior, it's very easy to get a Poincaré section by compactness. So by compactness,
we can find a finite set of transverse disks d1 up to dn such that if you give me an alpha a priori I can find di's such that the flow box that you, when you get di and you flow up to time alpha, when you consider the union of all this flow box, you cover the whole manifold. Okay? And why is that good? That is good because I'm pretty sure that every point of M at most after time alpha is going to hit one of these disks di. So I call the union of the eyes a point of resection. Lambda equals to the union of the eyes. And in order to, to avoid problems with the return time, let us assume that these the eyes are disjoint. So assume finite set of disjoint. transverse disks. This might require a little, a little bit of more work. Sometimes you have to get one of the DIs when it intersects a DJ. You would have to flow one of the DIs a little bit in order not to intersect DJ. But that can be done. Okay, so this is the point of resection and what is its property? So for every x in M and in particular for every x in lambda, there exists a time t of x which belongs to the open interval, it's strictly bigger than zero and at most alpha, such that when you get x and you flow by this time t of x, you come back to the section. Okay? So you are starting somewhere here. And then I'm pretty sure that there is a time and this time I'm going to get the minimum. So the minimum dx, the minimum T positive such that phi T of X comes back to lambda. So you are here, you flow time, flow the minimal time such that you come back to lambda. Okay? And I'm going to give a name to this map. The association of X to the position that you first hit the section back is what I'm going to call a Poincaré return map. So what is a Poincaré return map? Yeah, I require them to be disjoint here. In principle, they are, they are not disjoint, but then I said that you can make them disjoint by probably whenever you see a non-trivial intersection, you have to flow one of the DIs a little bit in the flow direction. Okay? So that's why I'm pretty sure that the time t is positive. Okay, so the point of return map is this association that I just described to you. is a map from the section to the section and f of x is given as the first return of x to the section. Okay? So what is this thing? This thing is a two-dimensional, well, map. Not necessarily a diffeomorphism. You're going to see soon why it is usually not a diffeomorphism. But it's two-dimensional. And what we want to see is exactly what we wished to get here. We wanted to mod out the flow direction in order to see hyperbolicity in the transverse direction. So it is exactly with respect to this map that we aim to see non-uniform hyperbolicity. Okay? So how am I going to do that? Well, let x that belongs to lambda, that we know that it has a good non-uniform hyperbolicity. So let x such that there exist vectors esx and eux. such that 
you know that the Lyapunov exponent associated to this first one is smaller than minus rhi. And well, here I have to put the Lyapunov exponent with respect to the flow, so I should divide by t and I should apply the derivative of the time t map of the flow. I assume that this is smaller than minus rhi, and the other one is bigger than rhi. t goes to plus minus infinity. Okay. So you have here a surface, or let us say that x belongs to some di. And above x, you have the tangent space of x with respect to the manifold, which is three-dimensional. And you have the tangent space with respect to the plate, to the surface, which is two-dimensional. So let us say that this guy here is tx di. And well, you know that you have three vectors in the txm, this. And one of them is the flow direction. You know it's transverse to this plane. And you have two other vectors which give you stable and unstable direction. So this is ESX and this is EUX. And what I want is to find directions for the Poincaré return map for which I see non-uniform hyperbolicity. So what should I do? I want to mold out the flow direction, right? So what I will do is that, well, if this guy is contracting and if this guy is neutral, I know that this plane here, if you iterate it backwards, it's going to expand. So if I want to mold out this direction, what do I do? I get this plane and I intersect it with this other plane, I get a direction, and then I just normalize it. So in other words, what, what I can do is that I can get this ESX and delete and project it into this plane in this direction to get a direction here in Tx di. And then I just normalize to get a unit vector. So I'm going to define a vector Nsx, which is exactly this. It is the projection, projection of Esx to this plane in this direction. And the same thing for with Eu. So let me give colors for these guys. And then I get the NUX. So the definition is or lambda actually unitary given by the projection of ESX to TX lambda in the direction of X. And similarly, NU. Okay? And it is in these directions that I wish to see non uniform hyperbolicity. Well, this is actually true, so you have a lemma, or oh, this is morally true. You need some properties of the angles also, but forget about them, or maybe not, I don't know. So the lemma is that if you now calculate the Lyapunov exponents of f in this direction, you get something that's negative, and if you calculate the Lyapunov exponent of f in this direction, you get something that's positive. And you can actually give a lower bound of this number, which is the following. So lim of 1 over n log dfn 
in Sx. This is smaller than minus He prime. It will be a new He. And in the U direction, this is smaller than He prime. And you can actually put He prime. It is a multiple of He. And how does it depend on He? It is, you can take He prime to be He times the minimum time that you get here in this return map. Minimum of T of X. Okay? Well, this number is positive. So what you got is that whenever you see a hyperbolicity bounded away from He, for the map F, you see a hyperbolicity bounded away from He prime. Correct? So what is the goal now? Well, the goal is to get the measure that we have in the ambient and consider a new measure here and conclude that this new measure here is going to be He prime hyperbolic. Then we have a two-dimensional map which is, and we have a measure which is He prime hyperbolic and we hope to apply the same methods of the proof of yesterday for F. Okay? Okay, so then if mu is He hyperbolic we can project mu to a measure nu on lambda that is E prime hyperbolic. And how do you get this measure nu? The measure nu, some people call it the flux measure. And what is the flux measure? Let us say that you want to measure a subset of your section here. You want to give a reason for this measure here. Okay? So how do you do? You flow this set a little bit above. So you flow it up to time epsilon, for example. And this is now a subset of M, so you can measure it with respect to mu. Right? And you want to know what happens in the limit as epsilon goes to zero. So the definition of nu is just, if you call this translation here A epsilon, and actually we know that A epsilon is phi zero epsilon of A, the definition of the flux measure and measures more or less how much you are passing through the section is the limit of the measure mu that you started with. And then you divide by epsilon. Okay? So this measure nu, nu is F invariant. And by the lemma, it is He prime hyperbolic. Okay? So now what we have is that we have a a map that is defined in the surface, two-dimensional guy, and we have a measure that is He prime hyperbolic. And now everything seems beautiful. We can just apply Sarig's results, right? Not right. Why? Sarig's results requires that this map F is a diffeomorphism at least of, of uh, regularity C1 plus beta. But this map F, in general, is not even continuous. Why? Because the section lambda is not connected. It is given by the union of these joint disks. So what happens, and what will happen, F is not continuous. 
And what is, what is the reason of that? It is caused by boundary effects. So what happens if you have this situation here, and you know that this point here hits this section back exactly at the boundary of the next disk. So this boundary here, if you flow it backwards, it defines a curve here. And this curve is separating this disk into two parts. And the property of it is that if you get a point to the left of it, you will hit the same section, the same disk. But if you get a point to the right of it, you will miss this disk. And you will hit another one. So you lose the continuity along this curve, right? So f is not even continuous. So in order to analyze where it is continuous, let me give a name to the discontinuity set. So let d to be the discontinuity set. And well, there is still a hope. And the hope is that, OK, let us see the map f away from this discontinuity set. And let us, OK, outside this discontinuity set, I know that my map f is going to be continuous, and it's actually going to be a local diffeomorphism. If you consider a small neighborhood of the point outside the discontinuity set, well, you can conclude that the map f is a local, is a diffeomorphism onto this small image. OK? Make sense? Yes, but that, that is usually not the case, right? Yeah. Okay, so let D equal to be the discontinuity set. Well, there is a problem, another problem. What happens if this D is relevant for the dynamics, for the measure? So I want to code almost every point. So I'm aiming to apply the same methods of Sarid. Oh, here is new to code new almost every point, right? In particular, I would like this set D to have zero new measure. So we want new of D to be equal to zero. Otherwise, we will not be able to code all the points, most of the points of our map F, okay? OK. So we're going to see soon that we have actually a bigger problem. So I'm, I'm going to forget for a while about that condition, nu of d equals to 0. And I'm going to try to explain what is the bigger problem. And in order to do that, let us try to follow the steps that we did yesterday in order to construct the symbolic dynamics. So let's try to apply the method for surface diffeomorphisms. to the pair or to the triple lambda f nu. So what is the step one? Cell phone. Step one is to construct passing charts. And actually it was to construct epsilon double charts, but let us first to construct passing charts. And how were they defined? They were, they defined, they were defined in a domain like this. Taking values somewhere, given by a composition map, a linear map of the exponential map. Here we can do the same thing. Since we have these two vectors, we can construct that map C of x, and we can compose this map C of x that is a map from R2 to this tangent space. We can compose with the exponential map of my section, and that gives me a map from R2 to the section, right? But note, yesterday, we defined Q epsilon of x as what? As e to the over epsilon to the 3 over beta, it's, a, it's an ugly formula. But what I want to say is that it only depends on the 
linear behavior of f. It only depends on the derivative of f, right? Well, the same definition here is not going to work. Because what happens if I have a good hyperbolicity, so this number is big, but my point x is very close to the boundary. Since my point x is very close to the boundary, the exponential map is not defined in this domain. So I cannot define the composition. So in order to avoid that, I should not consider q of epsilon to be equal to this but also take into account how far my point x is from the boundary of the section. So I'm going to consider q of epsilon not as equal to this, but as a minimum of this and the distance of my point x to the boundary of the section. Okay? And now I'm in good shape. I'm able to define the psi x, the passing chart, as, as a map from a subset of R2, a small subset of R2, to my section. So step one is done. Let us try to do step two. Step two, it was coarse graining. It is done in the same way as before. So I'm just going to, to write it here and say that it is OK. It can be done. And let us go to step three. And step three is infinite to one extension. Well, I'm going to show you soon. So in principle, you could have a set of positive measures that is converging to the, to the boundary exponentially fast, right? So I want to make sure that the section that I construct does not have this property. And that's the last part of the, of the discussion. So the step three is to construct an infinite one extension. So remember that the infinite one extension was a map pi from sigma to m that uses the graph transform method in order to construct this map. So this uses the graph transform method. And remember that in order to apply the graph transform method, we needed the sizes of the charts to be comparable, right? So we apply the graph transform method not to, this, not to these charts because we don't know what is the dependence, how this, these numbers vary if you, when you take it at x and when you take it at f of x. We need it to pass to a smaller size of charts, which is the small q of epsilon that I defined yesterday, and to apply that for the small q. So this, it only works after we pass to a smaller domain minus q epsilon x, q epsilon x squared. And what was q epsilon x? We defined it to be the minimum of e to the epsilon n q epsilon f n of x or integer n. Well, and we want, if we want to get something, we want this q epsilon to be positive, right? This guy is going to be positive. He's saying something about the decay of this. So remember that yesterday I claimed to you, okay, the q epsilon defined only as this expression, I'm, I, I know that almost everywhere, this q epsilon doesn't go to zero exponentially fast. And that was the key point to define the q epsilon in, order, in a way that it is positive, right? But now I introduce the term here. I no longer know if this q epsilon is going to zero sub-exponentially fast. And I need that, because otherwise the q epsilon that I'm going to define here is going to be zero, and I cannot apply the graph transform method for a point. Okay? So, Hence, we need that the section lambda satisfies the following. Satisfies that the 
measure of points that are in lambda that are approaching the boundary of lambda exponentially fast which is just this set I want this measure to be zero if this measure is zero I know that for almost every point this limb inf is zero so I know that these numbers do not go to zero exponentially fast so I have q epsilon as the minimum of two numbers both of them do not go to zero exponentially fast so I can define the small q like that then I have a positive number then I can apply the graph transform method and get the infinite one extension okay so this is the main goal and I think it answers your question right if I can answer this, yes. So how do we construct a section? So the goal now is to construct a section that satisfies this. A priori, the section that I fixed here in the beginning might not satisfy that. So how do I do? The idea is, okay, I'm not going to consider only one candidate for a section. I'm going to consider many candidates for a section. And I'm actually going to consider one parameter family of candidates for a section. So in order to get this, star, we consider a one parameter family lambda t of Poincaré sections and how do I do that? well I can just I can just parameterize them by the radius of each of these disks so what I'm doing is that I'm fixing lambda and I'm changing a little bit the radii of each of the disks that compose lambda okay? okay so Put, you can put here parameterized by the radii yes yes you increase a little bit each of them at the same time no you get the same number of disks you just change the radius so you have many disks here that compose lambda and what is going to be lambda t? You are going to increase all of them at the same time. Yes, so if you increase them, they will certainly cover m. And if you increase them just a little bit, they will also certainly be disjoint. Okay? They are closed disks, so if you increase a little bit, they will... I don't mind. The cylinders are not supposed to be disjoint. They will never be disjoint. I have a connected manifold, so it cannot be equal to the union of these of this flow boxes. I just want the DIs to be disjoint. So, in white here, I have, for example, lambda uh, A. And in red, I have lambda t. Okay, parameterized by the radii of the disks. So what we show is that, well, maybe my initial lambda will not have that property star. But if I consider a one-parameter family of lambdas, then almost every parameter is going to give me the property star. So proposition... For Lebesgue, almost every T in AB, the section lambda T satisfies star. How do we do that? 
Okay, so for each t, let us look at the bad points. Actually, let me do the following. Fix alpha positive and define the bad points for t with uh, quantity alpha. And what is that? It is the set of points in lambda t such that that limb inf is negative and not only negative, it is smaller than, uh, smaller than or equal to minus alpha. 1 over n log distance fn x boundary of lambda t smaller than or equal to minus alpha. Okay? Do you agree that if I fix alpha and then I show that for almost every t this guy has zero measure, then I'm in good shape. Because I can just take an increasing sequence, a decreasing sequence of rational alphas going to zero, and then I intersect all of these sets and I get the result. Right? So my goal is fix this scale alpha and let us show that this guy here has zero measure for almost every parameter t. Okay, so we want that the measure of bt is equal to zero for Lebesgue almost every t in ab. Okay, so what I will do is the following. bt is, is the set that you fix t and you look at the bad points x. I will do the opposite. I will fix x and look at the bad parameters t. Okay, so bt is you fix t and look at x. And I'm going to define now a set ex, ix, which is exactly the opposite. You fix x and look at t. So what is that? Ix is the parameters t such that when you fix x, you have this property here. So let me give a name for this to be two stars. Okay? So instead of trying to prove, the way that I will I'll show that almost every t gives me zero measure for the set is doing a double counting argument, which is known in the integration form as Fubini's theorem. So by Fubini's theorem, I know that if I want to integrate the measure of all the BTs, and note that since I want to show that this is zero almost everywhere, it is enough to show that this integral is zero, right? It's the integral of non-negative numbers, so if it's zero, it, it's equivalent of, of the, to this being zero almost everywhere. So how do I calculate this integral? I change the order of integration, and I calculate the Lebesgue measure, or the size of the i's of x. Right? Fubini. Okay, now I'm, uh, what I want to show is that this right-hand side, this right-hand integral is equal to zero. Actually, we have that the integrand function is identically equal to zero. Claim the Lebesgue measure of all of these intervals is zero. Why? What it means for a point to be here? You are fixing an x, so you have the itinerary of x in the section. And for a point to be here, it needs to define a radius such that the boundary of this section is exponentially close to the, to the trajectory of this point x. So if you have the trajectory, it means that the, the boundary of the section has to be in the limb soup of some intervals that, whose sizes are going to zero exponentially fast. So what do I mean? I mean that i of x is the limb soup of some intervals, i n, where i n is an interval of r of size 
approximately e to the minus alpha n. And what do I mean by that? Well, that happens because if you have this, then it means that you have this picture here. So you have the center of the disk. Let me do it bigger. You have the center of the disk here, and you have the point Fn of x. If this distance is smaller than this, it means that the section that you are considering here, the time t, should define a section for which this distance here is of the order or smaller than or equal to e to the minus alpha n. So that interval is the interval that is centered at this distance, the distance of the center of the disk to fn of x, and whose radius is e to the minus alpha n. So this is the interval i n. Okay? And what is the property of the interval i n? It is exponentially small. So in particular, the sum of its lengths is smaller than zero. Oh, it's smaller, it's smaller than infinity. Right? So by Borel Cantelli, you know that the limb soup of these intervals. And what is the limb soup? It's the set of points that belong to infinitely many of these intervals. You know that the Lebesgue measure of this limb soup is zero. And that's the end of the proof. So since the sum of i n is smaller than infinity, Borel Cantelli implies to you that the Lebesgue measure of i of x is zero. And you just showed that almost every parameter t defines to you a section that satisfies this star property. Since it satisfies this star property, we can apply the step three. We can get an infinite one extension. And then we can apply the step four, which is the bowen snag refinement, and get the coding for f. Once you get the coding for f, it is very easy to get the coding for the flow itself. You just suspend the coding for f by the time it takes for you to start in the section and come back to the section and you are done, okay? Question or observation. Why can't we do all the same time for all the measures? Why can't we do that for, for all the measures? Well, we, we could if we had this for all the measures, all the fl flux measures coming from he hyperbolic measures. Well, our methods, you see, you have to fix the measure in order to apply, for example, this Fubini argument here. We are not able to code all the measures simultaneously. Okay? And uh, thank you for your time. So this is the, this is the end of uh, my mini course.